All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So my name is Eric Uriegas. I'm the student development specialist for the Department of Bicultural Bilingual Studies. Uh, what that means is I'm your point of contact, your first point of contact when you're interested in applying all the way through graduation. I will help in a variety of capacities and work with our students to make sure that they are successful. If I could go ahead and have our faculty and our students, uh, we have two PhD students with us this morning. If you could go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, I'm Dr. Howard Smith and I'm a professor and I work primarily with bicultural bilingual education. I'm Dr. Katherine Henderson, and I'm currently the um, PhD graduate advisor of record. So I'm currently running our PhD program, um, although I will uh, soon be uh, out of that role and um, kind of back to my traditional role, which is supporting the, the PhD program and also um, working in the um, TESOL portion of our MA program. Hi, I'm Francine. Um, I'm a PhD candidate of culture, literacy, and language, and I will be graduating in December. And I'm Maya Vidal. I'm a first year uh, doctoral student in the culture, literacy, and language PhD, and I also work full time at BBL. Thank you. So these are our wonderful people who have volunteered on a Saturday morning to be here. So thank you for being here. Let's go ahead and begin. So this is a photo of our faculty, some of our graduates. We'll go through our faculty right here on this next slide. This is our department chair, Dr. Sanchez. She will oversee the programs within the department. We have our graduate advisor of record for our PhD, Dr. Henderson, who is currently with us. As she mentioned, there will be a transition, but we can get to that a little bit later on the presentation. Our graduate advisor of record for the program of teaching English as a second language or Master of Arts in teaching English as a second language is Dr. Christensen, so right over here. And then Dr. Smith is with us today as well. He is our graduate advisor of record for the Masters in Bicultural Bilingual Education. Our programs offered within department, as we mentioned, those three degrees, we had the doctoral with the PhD in Cultural Literacy and Language, a Master's of Arts degree in Bicultural Bilingual Education, a Master's of Arts in teaching English as a second language, but we also have graduate certificates in bilingual reading specialist and teaching English as a second language. Now the graduate certificates are 15 hour programs. They are not certifications. It's commonly confused with certifications from TEA to become a teacher. These are graduate certificates from the university. So I do wanna make sure that's clear. We can discuss more of that information. It is about half of the degree for the masters for either one. So depending on what you already have, if you already have a master's, but you don't wanna get another master's degree, this could be an option. If you just wanna get a graduate certificate to get a feel for graduate school, you can do that as well. But we'll go into that a little bit further on into the presentation. Currently, we have 142 students in, at the graduate level within the Bicultural Bilingual Studies Department. We have 47 students in Bicultural Bilingual Education. We have 51 in Teaching English as a Second Language and 44 students studying the PhD in Culture, Literacy and Language. The first thing I want to talk about are our deadlines. Looking at our deadlines for domestic students and international students are listed below. For the summer, if you still want to start for this summer, you can go ahead and apply by the end of today. Tomorrow is the deadline, so your application does need to be in by the end of the day. Now, if you're looking to start in the fall, fall will be August 1st. The international student deadline has already passed, unfortunately. If you want to start in the spring as an international student, you can apply by September 15th. For domestic students, you need to apply by December 1st for spring 2021. Looking at these deadlines, what I always like to tell people, if you can, do not wait to the last minute. It is a process to get your application. It has to go through the graduate school. From the graduate school, it's processed and approved. It comes to the department. From the department, it gets approved and reviewed by faculty, and it goes to the college. The college will make a decision, and then it goes back to the graduate school for the final decision. So it does take time. I want to say it takes about two weeks to process, three weeks. With the transitions from working from home, unfortunately, it is a little bit more difficult because we don't have the access we have on campus. So it does increase that timeline. If you can, I'd say apply a month out. That way you have enough time to meet with your faculty advisor without feeling rushed. Once again, deadlines are listed right here, but go ahead and check out our website at graduateschool.utsa.edu to review all these application deadlines as well. Admission requirements for both the Masters of Arts in Teaching English in the Second Language and for Bicultural Bilingual Education you need a bachelor's degree. You need to be in good standing with your last institution that you attended. 
if you were on probation or you graduated on probation, you are not in good academic standing with your last institution. It will make you ineligible to apply and get into one of our programs. This doesn't happen very often, it's pretty rare, but if you're unsure, just check your transcripts and this should give you an idea of what your standing is. We need a GPA of a 3.0 or better in your last 60 hours of coursework. You can go back and review your GPA. Overall GPA is, is gonna be different, so look at the last 60 hours. There is a calculator on our website as well. So if you're unsure of how to do that, you can walk through those steps that way. We prefer a completion of 18 credit hours in the field of study that is related to the program. We've seen people who study Spanish and decide to come into bicultural bilingual education. It is a related field. Faculty will look at your courses and your transcripts and make that determination. If you have questions about that, feel free to ask me um, at the end or we can set up a meeting to discuss that as well. And then lastly, TOEFL or IELTS scores for international applicants. Now this one's a little tricky. As of right now, with the current situation, a lot of people aren't able to get that testing done. The college is allowing the department to make those decisions based off the academic achievement of the student and if they have any kind of supplemental scores they can put in. For now, if you can't do it, that's okay. Check the graduate school website and it should keep you up to date with what you need. So if you do not meet admission requirements, commonly we'll see people with a GPA that may be right there at like a 2.99, but they don't have a 3.0 you are still able to be admitted. You would just be admitted on probation. It means that you need to make a 3.0 or higher to have that probation lifted from your account. What I always like to tell students is it's okay to be admitted on probation. Don't let that hold you back. When you apply and you receive that information, work with your faculty advisor. Our faculty and our department work with our students to help ensure their success. So as long as you're communicating with your advisor and the instructor of the course, we can help you to get through that semester but do not let this deter you from applying to the program. The other thing to be aware of are people who may not have studied anything in education. For example, if it is marketing, it's not really a teaching English as a second language or bicultural bilingual education. If you don't have those hours, we can assign background courses to help you be successful within our programs. And this is determined by the faculty who review the applications. So Dr. Smith, for example, or Dr. Christensen special graduate students. So if your GPA does not meet the 2.7 to be admitted on probation or a 3.0 to be admitted, you can apply as a special graduate student. So this student would be a non-degree seeking student. You would need a 3.0 in the last 30 hours instead of 60. This would allow you another opportunity to apply, show that you can be successful in the program, bring up your grades, and then from that point you would reapply to the program and you'd be able to be admitted as a degree seeking student in the program. You can take up to 12 hours, so in our department that's four classes, and those four classes will still count towards your degree. We just want to make sure that we're mindful of how many classes we're taking before reapplying. There are times where people take too many classes, and we have to petition for that. But as long as you maintain communication with us, we will do what we can to make sure that you stay on track if you apply as a special graduate student. The course schedule, uh, typical fall and spring semesters, and Dr. Smith, Dr. Anderson, feel free to jump in, or Maya and Francine, you both teach here as well about 16 to 17 weeks long at the master's level. Most of the time, the classes will be on a weeknight from six to 845. Summer courses may meet during the day. There are times where that does happen. Right now, with the current situation, we will not be meeting in person. As of now, the summer classes are all online. This won't apply to this current summer. There are courses in our department that are offered online. Usually that's gonna be the Teaching English as a Second Language program. And we also have a hybrid format that allows for one meeting, so let's say if we have class on Tuesday, it will be in person, the following Tuesday would be online. It will go back and forth between being in person and being online. Courses do meet at our downtown campus or our 1604 campus, it is both, so you need to make sure that you're checking the schedule when you select your courses. And right now we do not have a program that is exclusively online. And I'm gonna go ahead and let Dr. Smith talk about the Masters of Arts in Bicultural Bilingual Education here. The program that we offer is primarily for individuals that have had education in the classroom. It's important that individuals seeking a master's degree with this focus understand that our goal is to prepare individuals to offer instruction in two languages. This is not a TESOL degree because you'll find out later the TESOL program, while it is for individuals that will work in the U.S., it's also for a person with international aspirations, 
And quite honestly, the BBED program is geared for individuals that want to work in the K-6 levels in the United States. And so a lot of the references, a lot of the case studies, the examples will come from the experiences here in the United States. And if you look at the program of study, I believe it's five of our courses that will be offered either uh, partially or completely in Spanish. So the MA program in bilingual ed is one that requires people to have a certain level of proficiency in Spanish. Um, your Spanish will improve as a result of being involved in a lot of different activities. But again, it's for individuals that plan to work within a U.S. context and those people that wish uh, to work in primary levels. There are opportunities to use, of course, the masters in, in bilingual ed at the high school level uh, as schools or school districts are creating more and more dual language programs. We do see a need. Uh, but again, if you don't like little kids, I don't recommend you do the bilingual ed program because we are primarily focused on the primary grades. Right now, we have a couple of options. So again, you can do a thesis or you can do uh, two courses extra in order to finish your program. Right now, we have a 30-hour master's degree program. That's 10 classes, and each class has a value of three credits. And the credit hours are distributed amongst the following themes. Uh, social cultural studies, bilingual ed theory, linguistics, teaching methodology, research and assessment, and ESL. Your graduate study will give you a solid foundation beyond what a person would normally get at the undergraduate level in the different components of a solid asset-based approach to bilingual instruction. Here in San Antonio, our department has provided, I would argue, at least 50% of the bilingual teachers that we have in, in the city, in the county. We do a good job. We're not the only game in town, but we, we do a good job. And um, I think that if you were to contact any of the school districts, and I mean any of them, and ask, um, are they satisfied with the caliber of the graduates that they are getting from our program at the undergrad or the master's level specifically, um, what would they say? And so with that, I, um, I pass the mic back to Eric. Thank you, sir. We did mention it earlier, but I wanna make sure it's clear. We have the teacher certification option available for this master's as well as teaching English as a second language. For that, you would need to apply to our program, but also apply to that specific teaching track. We can cover more about that at the end, but as Dr. Smith said, we do have a lot of teachers, a lot of people who work in K through sixth grade. There is a certification option there as well. And then I'm going to go ahead and transition to teaching English as a second language. I'm going to go ahead and let Dr. Henderson talk a little bit about this degree as she serves as faculty within the program. All right. Well, first of all, um, thank everybody. Thank you all for joining us today on this Saturday morning to learn more about our programs. Um, our MA TESOL is a program for people that are looking for an advanced career in the field of English language teaching. And the graduates of our program become teachers, instructors, curriculum developments, program coordinators. We have a really interesting mix of students on the TESOL program because we have students that are seeking to work internationally upon graduation. We have students that are interested in working in the K-12 classrooms as an ESL specialist and pursue our certification option. We have um, students that are interested in teaching English and they might want to do that in the local community or uh, again in a, in a different context. So one of the exciting parts about the MA TESOL is we've got a lot of diversity in our students. So if you have specific questions about what you're interested in doing and how the program serves you, um, feel free to ask at the end. Similar to the BBED master's program, the TESOL is a 30 semester credit hour 10 classes with a comprehensive exam and you can complete a thesis or special project um, that would be based on an individual decision. And the courses that you complete are connected to language theory, language use, classroom practice and program design, research, and then you would have that option for the thesis or elective. 
Um, again, if you're interested in getting that actual certification to teach in public schools in Texas, that does have additional requirements to it. Um, and you can ask about that if that's your specific area of interest at the end, or of course we will provide you with emails. Okay, I think that's the information about the MA TESOL. Thank you. And we're gonna go ahead and transition to the doctoral program. Dr. Henderson will lead this. So I'm gonna go ahead and put myself back on mute. Dr. Henderson, just let me know when and I'll go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm also gonna continue. I know that um, several of you here are interested in the PhD program. And even those of you that are doing your master's, you might be interested to know a little bit about what, what it would take to do a PhD after your master's. So our um, PhD program is CLL, Culture, Language, and Literacy. It makes it a very, um, powerful and unique PhD program and that we're interdisciplinary in nature across those area. And our faculty represent um, both interdisciplinary uh, ex uh, expertise as well as um, particular faculty that are trained uh, strong in, in one particular area. So we have some faculty that are more language uh, trained faculty and others that are perhaps more culture oriented. But overall, the training in our program um, when you graduate, you'll have that interdisciplinary knowledge, which um, again, I think is something that has made our program such a standout and have such a strong national reputation. Um, we provide that rigorous training in research methodologies and we prepare graduates for professional and academic positions. Um, and this is something that perhaps our, um, our students that are current, uh, current PhD students could talk a little bit more about. But certainly we do have a large number of graduates that go on to get faculty positions both nationally and internationally. But we also have many students that go on to advance their careers um, in different ways, in different avenues. Um, and again, if you have questions about that, we can address those. Um, I can go to the next slide. Here is the um, visual representation of that interdisciplinary aspect of our program. So we've got the biculturalism, cultural studies, applied linguistics, um, and bilingual education and biliteracy. And here is the details for this program. So it's 60 hours of post-master's work, 24 semester credit hours of required coursework, foundation course, core courses, and designated electives, a minimum of 12 semester credit hours in research methods. That was um, something that I highlighted before about the rigorous methodological training you receive in this program. Three hours of directed doctoral research, 12 hours of dissertation, and the remaining hours are elective courses, which you receive based on approval from your advisor. Um, requirements include written and oral qualifying exams, um, a dissertation proposal, and a dissertation defense. And those are these lar large milestones that you, um, that you meet throughout your, your PhD program. So um, importantly, what do you need to do if you're interested to apply? You need to have a master's degree in a related field. We do have students that apply from a, many different kinds of backgrounds in terms of what their master's degree. So if you see um, an interest and connection to what you did in your master's and perhaps you gained experience, I would encourage you to apply um, and the uh, graduate, the the doctoral studies committee um, will make that determination when reviewing applications, but certainly apply if you um, see uh, this program fitting with your current interests. Um, the portfolio consisting of the following items are needed for your application. Your transcript with um, a GPA of 3.5 or higher, your G a GRE score that's been taken within the last five years. And I'll just note here that I've served on the graduate studies review committee for the last three years. And we do not weigh the GRE scores as heavily as we do other application materials. So if you're nervous about the GRE, or if that's a reason why you're kind of wondering um, whether or not you're a strong applicant, I would absolutely encourage you to apply regardless of, of the score, because again, we take other admission materials into uh, consideration um, for making our, our final decisions. Proficiency or experience learning, using, studying, or speaking a language other than English. Three letters of recommendation, a statement of purpose, and an academic writing sample. And just to make um, a comment about the three letters of recommendation, ideally we do like to see some academic letters of recommendation. So if you've been um, a teacher for a long time, um, rather than try to maybe have all three of your letters come from, you know, either a principal or somebody in your district or a specialist, do try to maybe 
make ensure that you get at least one, two, or even three of your of your letters of recommendation coming from your master's degree or somebody that can speak to your um, your academic potential in a in a graduate program. The letters of recommendation. Uh, yep, here we go. Ask for a letter of recommendation from an academic perspective. I already got ahead of myself. All right, next slide. <laughs> Statement of purpose, the description of research interests, reasons for seeking your doctoral study, and connections between the applicant's interests, professional goals, and the program and culture, literacy, and language. And in this, you can also expand upon your linguistic um, experiences and, and how they're, they're suited for, for being in the program. Um, the statement of purpose, when I, and I can't speak for all the faculty mem members, but when I am evaluating doctoral students, this is actually the key document for me. I read it carefully and I see, are you a fit with our program? Are you real? Have you really thought through whether or not you want to do a PhD program? And often that can come through or not in a, in a statement of purpose. Do you have a um, sort of a clear connection to the field of, you know, culture, literacy, and language that is a, a, a fit with our, with our program? So my strong recommendation uh, and this would actually be true for applying to any phd program is to spend a lot of time on your statement of purpose have it read by multiple people and you can even seek advice from a, a faculty member say oh i'm you know i'm trying to apply to your program um do you have any you know advice and and um certainly we could uh, set up those those types of consultations um, if you're interested. And then your academic writing sample should be what you would consider representing your strongest academic um, writing. And that can be a paper, a thesis, something you've published, um, anything that you feel gives it the, the committee a sense of your academic writing. The deadline, the application is available on the University Graduate School website. And um, we provided that uh, link before. The priority funding deadline is November 1st, and the final application deadline is February 1st. Um, no exceptions will be made if the application is not submitted by the deadline and includes all items for the degree. If I can just jump in for a moment, GRE is required. I know some people are unable, well, not some, everyone's unable to take a GRE at the current moment. Uh, we know that people may wanna apply for a priority funding deadline. We encourage you to try, but we are anticipating GRE being a part of the application regardless of the situation. We are hoping that it will open up. So if you are unable to take the GRE before November 1st, please try and get that in before February 1st. If things change, it will be updated on the graduate school website. If you visit the graduate school uh, website for UTSA, at the top there should be a banner that has COVID-19 updates. Please check with that. But I do want to let you know before the questions come, um, GRE is still expected as of now. Right, and I just saw the um, comment from Francine, one of our current advanced doctoral students. So absolutely, jump in. What did you want to add? Um, I just wanted to add um, to this. I'm a first-gen college student, and so I'll be honest, I didn't really know exactly what I was doing the first time I tried to write this. And um, luckily, I knew two people that were in my support team that have a PhD. And so I showed my first draft to them and they both kind of slaughtered it in the exact same ways. Um, but I'm thankful that they did because they spared me the embarrassment and potential of not being chosen, right? Um, and so I really, really, really cannot stress enough that you need to let people look at it and give you feedback, especially if you know people that maybe are a little bit more advanced in their, in their studies than you. Um, and one of the tips that one of my friends with a PhD gave me, and I never would have known this, and she said, you know, Francine, when you're looking at a PhD program, they're also looking to see if you really fit in their program. Because obviously you can do a CLL PhD in other institutions, right? But they're, they're looking to see why should you go to this one? And so you really do need to also take the time reviewing the website and looking at the different professors um, to find out what their research interests are. And then the tip that she told me was, once you look at the professors and see their research interests, the ones that look most similar to you or most interesting to you, then you go to the library and you look up a couple of their most recent publications. And that way, when you're talking about your interest connecting to the research within the department, you're making very explicit, clear connections um, to the, how you might see yourself working with some of these professors or following this line of work at our institution. And obviously then you have your citations and references which again just shows that you know how to write academically. So I would just really encourage you to take the time to do all of that. 
to really do the research and make sure that it's really written well and have people look at it before you submit it. And I'm assuming really, I, I assume everything that we do goes through multiple drafts, right? So um, this is definitely not something that you think you, that you should think that you can write and just send it in. I'm assuming that to do this well, you should probably have a few drafts before you submit. So leave time for that work. Thanks. Thanks, Francine. So for the process, you're going to submit online, then we review applications, we make admissions decisions, and then after the admissions decisions, once we've said whether or not you're accepted to the program, we then actually do a whole nother process to determine who will receive for our doctoral student, for our doctoral appointments, who will receive funding. So we go through another process for those fellowship decisions. Um, applications will be re reviewed when they are received and the decisions are made in February and March. The faculty admissions committee reviews and makes determinations about the fellowships and admissions and the official decisions do get communicated through the graduate school. It's competitive and limited a meeting of all the requirements does not guarantee admission into the program. And this is accurate information. Our PhD program is highly competitive. We do have limited in number subject to ability of funds. We have fellowships. So when we offer a fellowship or an appointment to an incoming doctoral student, the requirements to accept that is that you're willing to work 20 hours for the department. And that could be a role that includes being a teaching assistant, an instructor of record, or a research assistant. The exact appointment will be dependent upon the needs of the department and your interests and fit with particular roles. Um, it also requires acceptance of a fellowship requires full-time enrollment. Your tuition and fees are covered as part of the financial package and you cannot hold outside employment. So just to clarify that a little bit, we do have um, part-time students and full-time students in our doctoral program. Most of our, uh, not, well, I guess not all, but a lot of our part-time students are full-time employed, right? They might be working as a teacher. Um, and so they tend, they are encouraged to take two classes per semester. Whereas our full-time enrollment students, that first year you will be taking three classes each semester. Um, Okay, I think, and I'm happy to answer more questions about that. So, um, but that's the basic about our, of our funding. Here's the estimated program timeline. Uh, in year one, you'll take pro seminar and core cor courses. In year two, you're gonna be beginning to finish up. You'll be taking more coursework and thinking about a dissertation topic. And then year three, that's when you wanna start to hit those big milestones, including completing your qualifying exam, beginning to do your proposal defense and finishing up that coursework. And years four and five, you should be working on your dissertation at that point, preparing for the job market if you are seeking that competitive uh, tenure track position and graduating. Yay. This is the um, breakdown of our program in more detail. And this is the full-time student course plan. So you can see, as I was just sort of saying, that you have your um, your pro seminar and core courses in that first semester. You've got three classes. This can be made available to you. We are happy to send you. This is also a, a working document that we are actually in the process of, 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 of working on to have it reflect um, the most accurate information. So know that this is sort of a draft, but what it, it can show you, and this is something I highly encourage actually, is when you apply for the program, make sure that you've looked through the course descriptions of these different courses that you'll be taking in that first year, right? The pro seminar, the core courses, um, so that you can say, okay, yes, the, this is the program I want. These courses are, they reflect my, my research interest and that interdisciplinary training that I want. If you have more questions about the, the courses and what you take, I think that'd be a great thing to ask at the end. And, and our current students, Francine and Maya, could speak to that since they're the ones that have taken the courses. I've taught the qualitative research method, so I could talk a lot about that. That's a course that you're going to take a qualitative research methods in your first year, um, and maybe I'll get to teach you. So that was the full time. This is the part time. The difference is, of course, that, that the small number, exactly. So Eric's circling it. That's a six, whereas on the previous one, it was nine. So nine credit hours, three, three courses, part time students, six credit hours, two courses. And then the, the summer you're expected to hopefully take two courses so that you can stay on the same path as a part-time student, as a full-time student. 
So we do have our plans are for part-time students and full-time students to graduate in the same timeline. All right, about funding information, we do have um, eligible scholarships from UTSA for our MA programs and competitive doctoral funding available, which again, I can answer any questions about. Every year, our, the number of students that get funded is, is varies. Um, so we've had years where we've funded, you know, well over five students and then students where we only fund two and that's dependent on a whole matrix of factors. So it's, um, it's sort of dependent year to year. And then, um, which actually is something kind of good to know because if you absolutely want to have full funding for your doctoral level program, I have seen a few students that might apply and you know that this is, you know, your dream and, and the pathway that you want to be on. I've seen students apply one year, not get a funding package and apply again the next year and get it. And they're contingent on funding. All right. We also have the link right here for the QR code. If you use your smartphone, turn on your camera, that should take you directly to the cost of tuition at UTSA. It is by semester credit hours. For most of the programs, it'll be three hours a class. So look at increments of three, and that will show you up this page after you download the spreadsheet, how much you should expect to pay. And then financial aid. Financial aid is available for graduate students. You can apply for FAFSA. Uh, please use this QR code to visit our financial aid page, and that should assist you to get more information about how to apply and who to speak with about that. Lastly, we are at the end. We are at our questions page. I recommend taking a picture of this uh, slide. We are going to turn off the PowerPoint so we can see everyone open up for questions and discussion. Uh, we have our graduate advisor of records emails here. Uh, Dr. Solis is listed for PhD. Uh, I believe that's going to be the transition. So as Dr. Sanderson transitions out, Dr. Solis will come back to being that graduate advisor of record. So you can go ahead and email him. And then our student development specialist for the PhD is my colleague, Molly Miller. So she will be the one who will help you from the staff side when looking at your application. So here's her email right here. Great. And I just added my own email to the chat because I am a faculty member that represents both the PhD program. I'm not going to be the advisor of record, but I will be on the committee. And because I'm serving currently as the advisor of record, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And also, um, as uh, Dr. Christensen is our graduate advisor for the, the MA program, but again, as a faculty member, I'm happy to answer any questions about the MA program as well. So mine is Katherine.Henderson2 because there was another Katherine Henderson. So I'm the two and uh, at utsa.edu. Thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the screen um, and we can go ahead and open up for questions. We also have our two PhD students, so feel free to ask Maya or Francine about their experience in the program. I know Maya just finished her first year. Congratulations, Maya. Uh, she had good insight on like applying and everything since she just did it recently. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, um, I just finished my second semester. I'm still about to begin the summer part of that first year. So, you know, there's more to go on this first year. But if anybody has a question to that, I haven't necessarily prepared anything in particular, but I can definitely give perspective um, to any questions about the application process or about um, being in the PhD part time and working full time because it's not really uh, half of the coursework. You're really looking at two thirds and you're working a lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot. So there's a way to manage it all, I think. And um, so if anybody's has questions about the actual um, experience, uh, I could talk about that, but uh, maybe open it up to questions from people to see what it is that you guys actually want to learn about. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions, or if you want to type your question in the chat box, feel free to do it that way as well. Also, Francine is, I'm the, like on my first year and Francine is on her last year, so. And just so you together know, we comprise the whole experience, right, Francine? And Maya and I actually got to know each other because my first year our offices were right next door to each other. Um, so that's how we got to know each other and we became friends. Um, I don't know, I'm getting ready to graduate. Um, I was a full-time student and I'm very thankful I was funded. Um, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, so I think my perspective is a little different um, being a full-time student. So I don't know if you guys, you know, have questions about that. Being again a first gen person, uh, a lot of my extended family doesn't really understand what I do, right? And so when they hear that I am my age going to school for full time, they think I'm just, you know, acting like an overgrown kid. 
but I will say that the, the workload that you do in a PhD, whether you do it full-time or part-time, is really intense. It's um, much more than anything I've ever done before. The amount of reading that you have to keep up with is intense. One tip, I did actually go to the Tomas Rivera Center, which is available on campus for academic coaching. Um, and I actually went to try to get some strategies on how to manage my time a little bit better my first semester. I'll be honest, I came from public schools where everything's on a bell, right? I mean, you can't even use the bathroom at your will, right? You have to wait for the bell to let you do that. And so um, to come to such an unstructured uh, use of time and have all these deadlines was kind of a shock to my system. And so one thing I would also suggest just for anybody doing a PhD is that um, I use a planner and I literally write out like what, what time I'm going to sit down and study. But I don't just say that I'm going to study. I actually say like what I'm going to read, like what chapters from what book. And um, that way you can be checking it off as you go along, feeling a little bit accomplished and knowing that it's going to get done by the time you meet your class next week, right? Um, because otherwise I think, you know, you run the risk of thinking, oh, I can do it later. And it's just too much. It's too much for anybody um, to do later. And so um, I really can't stress enough like the, the need for like structured time to sit down and do your work. Um, and I do know too, like some people like to work at home to do their schoolwork and they have a nice quiet place that they like to do it. And some people really prefer to go to the campus or the library, you know, depending on what your space is like or your family um, situation. And so you're going to have to figure out that also for yourself because you need to know that you have a place to work in a system that works for you. Um, so I would, I would just really encourage that. For, for success. I did have a question actually about, so in undergrad, I went to a pretty small school um, and I studied interdisciplinary studies. So even though we all had a really broad range of degrees, we were very tight knit community. Um, and so 157 students in the grand scheme is not a lot, but do you guys feel like there's a lot of like cross pollinating of ideas and like communication within the department or is it very kind of siloed depending on what you're studying? I'll say something that Maya, if you want to jump in, um, I feel like we're very close, um, especially in the doctoral program. Uh, we, we really help one another. We give each other study tips. We'll share notes sometimes. We just reach out and ask how people are. Um, I will say, I think the first year, is the hardest year for any PhD student. And so there's times when you laugh and there's times when you cry and it's just part of the experience. Um, but there's no judgment, it's a judgment-free zone. Uh, we laugh and cry together sometimes. Um, and I honestly feel like some of the people that I've met in this program are going to be my lifelong friends now. Um, and so I, like we say in our department that we're the BBL familia, and I would say that's really true. Really um, and just like an example really of how kind people are, um, I believe it was my second year here. My dad on Christmas Eve actually had a real medical emergency and I had to take him to the emergency room and he almost died. And I had to sign papers even that they weren't sure if what they were gonna try was gonna work and I understood that, but we were gonna take, take a chance. So I was kind of freaking out and I'm sitting in the waiting room and, and my, I moved here with my dad from Massachusetts for this program. So I don't have extended family here and it's Christmas Eve, like people are with their families, right? So I'm sitting there freaking out and I'm trying to like, you know, just kind of deal with it. And then one of my PhD friends actually just happened to text me to ask me what I did for Christmas Eve. And so I told her, I was like, oh, we're actually at the ER. Do you know she showed up 15 minutes later and she had a little snack bag and soda and sat with me? I mean, like, that's the kind of people that we have in this program. And so um, I, I think if you come, like, you can, you can feel confident. And I mean, I think it's like anything else too. I, I'm going to be an honest, honest about this. Like, you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s and I have work experience. And there's people that you get along with. You get along with they're not going to be like your best friend. Your best friend. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it definitely uh, we have a sense of family here. Um, if just to add to, to that, and I totally agree with you, Francine. Uh, how could I not? This is just such a beautiful program as far as the people, everything. But as far as the yeah interchanging ideas is that that's kind of what you were asking right susanna um mm -hmm. i think um yes and and but it's mostly up to you so you know yeah. to initiate relationships conversations and uh but because it is such an open and friendly environment as francine said it really lends itself to that you'll be hard pressed to find someone that says oh no i don't have time even though we're all extremely busy so, um, so yeah, it, it definitely, it's, it's a great place for that.
And um, just one other thing I wanted to kind of add on now, Maya made me think of this too, um, in terms of sharing ideas. I think that, you know, within your own cohort, especially you're gonna know who's doing what kind of work, like what's their interest. So you'll be like, oh, you know, my friend Janeth, she was um, interested in first gen Latinas in college, okay? Um, I'm interested in promoting academic, in uh, increasing academic achievement of secondary English learners at the high school level. And so you start to kind of learn like what's everyone's little bag. But then um, what I found was like with my friend Janeth, we use a lot of the same sources when we're writing. And so we're very familiar with a lot of the same readings. And so we would talk a lot. And I feel like, you know, I'm trying to get kids to be college ready. And then she's looking at kids or young adults in college, right? And so we kind of create a link there. And so we've talked about um, maybe in the future doing a study together. Um, and my friend Vicki, she's at the community college. And so um, our interests are very similar, but she's looking in a community college setting. And so I think that um, what's nice about that too is that once you kind of know whose um, who's work, who's then you can create you can create partnerships to do some studies and presentations together. So I have a question. So for the research, so I'm assuming Spanish is one of the languages that um, the primary research is in. What other languages? We've had students that um, come from China and use and and can speak Mandarin Chinese. Um, we've had people. Uh, we had a student from Turkey who really did a study about the um, Turkish American Turkish experience here in San Antonio. Um, we've had also um, somebody from Iraq, and um, he focused on uh, family community outreach for Iraqi families to help their children in schools. Um, so I mean, there are Arabic different speak languages. Arabic speakers, Arabic, Vietnamese, Vietnamese, yeah, um, Cambodia, yes. Uh, and our and our Spanish speaking, and we have you know Colombia, Puerto Rico, Mexico. But we've got Portuguese from yeah. It's a oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's a wonderful question that we could even um, maybe incorporate Eric into our next slide. We could like have sort of some of the the student profiles because it's um, a very both international and incredibly linguistically diverse uh, program. Yes. At the so PhD level. <laughs> at the PhD level. When it comes to Spanish, uh, we find a lot of Spanish used at the master's level. When it comes to the PhD level, it is a broad linguistic spectrum. And we have faculty that not only speak Spanish, um, that speak Russian, that speak Chinese. Um, and if there is a particular language group that you'd like to conduct research in, we are more than willing to help you recruit someone that has a deep understanding of that language variety for your research as a doc student. Well, with that, if you have questions, um, I will also type my email. Um, reach out to our faculty. They are a wonderful resource for you all. Uh, I can answer some of the logistics and some of the application stuff, help with that. Uh, if not, I can point you to the right person. Thank you to our volunteers for being here. So our faculty and our staff, thank you for being here. And thank you all for joining us on a Saturday morning. We appreciate it. We hope to see your application soon and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everybody. We hope to see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.